And this morning is from Ezra chapter 9, starting at verse 1, and reading until the end of the chapter. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them, and the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then, at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary, and so our God give, gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins, and he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through your servants the prophets when you said, The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt, and yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. Really, thank you so much, Karis. Thank you, uh, John, for leading us so well. Um, this morning uh, on Palm Sunday, where we remember Jesus uh, particularly as King, don't we? We'll keep um, Ezra 9 open in front of you. Um, let me pray as we come uh, to God's Word. Father, help us this morning. Uh, we ask as we um, sit under your Word, would you um, please teach us and encourage us? Uh, would you show us um, if we need uh, to think about our lives and think about how uh, we might be tempted to be unfaithful. Father, show us again uh, that our only hope is in Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, I used to love going to my granny's house. Um, she lived in Devon, and, and, it was, uh, and we used to love it basically because she had a massive garden. I and mean, it was great to see granny and grandpa as well, uh, but there was, they had a massive garden, which meant that... Uh, me and my brother could play cricket, and we could play it properly. You know, we, we had um, uh, stumps at both ends. Uh, there was enough, you know, we had four, six, all that kind of stuff. And, and I remember one particular morning, we're out playing cricket, and my brother comes into bowl, I'm batting, and I catch it perfect, right out of the middle. I've, I've launched it, and, there's just, and if you play cricket, you'll know this. Just, if, you, if you middle it, you know you don't want to run. You know, the fielders aren't going to get it. This is gone. Uh, and there's this brief moment of kind of smugness where you can just stand there and watch. Um, it, it was glorious. And then we heard the broken glass. <laughs> um, I'd call it so well. I mean, it was beautiful. But as we headed over to kind of deep mid-wicket, we discovered uh, that the ball had gone 
through the roof of the greenhouse and out the other side. <laughs> and you're kind of sat there then, aren't you? And it's kind of hold your hands up time. I mean, there are no excuses. I did try to say, well, look, if my brother hadn't bowled such a rubbish ball, I wouldn't have. But there was that bit where I had to go in the house, I had to find Granny and just hold my hands up. Yeah, I'm sure you've been in those situations. Well, maybe not. Maybe you've lived a better life than me. But you know, there are times, aren't there, where we just have to hold up our hands and say, my bad. I've got no leg to stand on. You know, there's no way you can wriggle yourself out of the situation and blame someone else. All you can do is hold your hands up and wait for the outcome. Well, that's kind of what we've got here in Ezra 9. I mean, it's much more serious here. But look down at verse 15, at the end of the chapter. As we get to the end of the chapter, here's what Ezra says. Lord... The God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant and feel the pain of these words. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. It's a pretty depressing conclusion to the chapter, isn't it? I mean, how's it come to this? Things were going so well, weren't they? Uh, if you've been with us in Ezra the last few weeks, we, we, you know, and, and through the whole book, we, we've seen um, people come back from captivity, making the journey back from Babylon. The temple's been rebuilt uh, despite opposition. You know, 60 years on, Ezra's been sent back with more people from Babylon to kind of teach the people, to bring them back to God. Uh, we've seen God's gracious hand over the people, moving the hearts of kings to make things happen, letting them go home, giving them money and stuff to rebuild. Uh, even last week, on Ezra's journey back home, we saw God's gracious hand providing all they needed, protecting them all the way. As we get to the end of chapter 8, we have uh, the returnees offering sacrifices at the temple. They make sure the king's orders are carried out. Um, all the material, the wealth that they've been sent back with is kind of stored in the treasury. And, and the people are looked after. It looks like right off into the sunset territory, doesn't it? It's been a battle. It's been a fight. But here we are. We're back. It's all happening again. But no, there's a problem. There's a problem. Chapter 9, uh, verse 1 and 2. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me, as Ezra, and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Pesarites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, Amorites. They've taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in unfaithfulness. There's a problem. There's a problem. And on the surface of it, it seems a little strange to us in 2021. The problem is this, that the people, including the priests, the Levites, the leaders, have been intermarrying with the neighboring nations. And this is condemned, at the end of verse 2, as being unfaithfulness. It's condemned as being unfaithfulness. Now, we need to be really clear and careful when we look at this this morning to understand exactly why this is a problem. Um, and, and straight up, I want to say... That the Bible is, is not here prohibiting interracial marriage. That, that that's not the problem. And th this is not a racial issue as we might understand it. I, I mean, actually, there are examples, aren't there, in the Old Testament of uh, foreign women marrying into the Jewish nation who then become absolutely crucial. <laughs> Rahab and Ruth both turn up in the genealogy of Jesus. Now, this isn't a racial issue. This is a spiritual one. You see, what we need to understand is that 
In the ancient Near East, two and a half thousand years ago, or so, if you married outside of your people group, if you married outside of your nation, then you automatically took on that other nation's gods and religious practices. Your sort of syncretism, this, this thing where you would worship multiple gods, was commonplace. You'd kind of do your religious duty to your god and then do your religious duty to your wife's god and, and, and all kind of be a mix and, a, and it was a mess. And so what's going to happen if the people of the one true God intermarry with the neighbouring countries who worship different gods, little g, well, they're going to be led astray. I mean, God's warned his people of that back in Deuteronomy 7. You know, the problem is not interracial marriage, but, but what in this context it, it leads to. Deuteronomy 7, 4 says, they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. You know, it leads to unfaithfulness. You know, who are the people going to trust? Who are they going to listen to? How are they going to live their life? How, how are they going to make decisions if they're being led astray by other gods, other religions, other practices? some of which are detestable. We haven't got time to go into that. It looks so good at the end of chapter 8. But as Ezra arrives back and gets things going again, he finds out there's a problem. And we see how bad this unfaithfulness is by Ezra's reaction. And down at verse 3, he tears his tunic and his cloak. He pulls hair from his head and his beard and he sits down appalled. He's utterly heartbroken. At the beginning of his prayer in verse 6, he is ashamed and disgraced. He's been sent back to teach and lead God's people and he clearly really has his work cut out. Because it seems as if Israel just hasn't learned the lesson. Sin and unfaithfulness has been a historic problem, and it looks like nothing has changed. He sits all day, and other faithful folk gather around him, appalled until the evening. And then he prays. And Ezra prays a heartfelt prayer of confession on behalf of the whole nation. You have to feel the anguish as you read this in Ezra's prayer. Do you feel the language. Our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached the heavens, verse 6. Verse 7, our guilt has been great from, from the days of our ancestors until now. And it was because of our sins, as we said, that's why we went off into exile. That's why we were defeated. That's why other kings and rulers came and destroyed our country. It was because of our sin. And then verse 10, God, what can we say now? We've done it again. We've forsaken you again. We've gone against your commands. It's happening again, God. What can we do? Verse 13. You know, we deserved your punishment last time, but, but you limited it. You punished us less than our sins have deserved, but, but surely now you're going to wipe us out. Surely we deserve nothing from you. Verse 14. Look at how we've repaid you. Look at how we've treated you. And we get to verse 15. We stand here in our guilt, but we cannot stand in your presence. Can you, can you feel that sense of despair? God, had, what have we done? What do we deserve? He's holding up his hands, isn't he? How bad? Israel deserve to be punished. 
There's no excuse. There's no blame shifting possible. They've been unfaithful. They stand condemned. Guilty as charged. There's nothing they can do to make it right. But there is hope. There is hope. Their only hope, Israel's only hope, is in God's grace. Did you pick that up in verses 8 and 9? As Ezra acknowledges the historic problem that Israel have had in why they went into exile in the first place. In verses 8 and 9, he, he, he makes a big thing of God's grace to them in the past. He's left them a remnant. He's given them a firm place in his sanctuary. He's given light to their eyes. He's not forsaken them, verse 9. He's shown them kindness. He's granted new life to rebuild, given us a wall of protection. You see, and you can kind of see that as Ezra has reminded himself of God's grace in the past, as he comes to the end of his prayer and he holds his hands up and says, look, we're, we're nothing, we're ruined. We deserve your judgment. You can wipe us out and that would be just God. You can see that, that by inference there is, a, there is a little lingering hope of God's continuing grace. Verse 15, is, he's falling on God's mercy again, isn't he? We stand before you guilty. Over to you. Israel's only hope is in God's continuing grace. That's all they've got. Well, the, the danger is here is that we then jump, we jump straight into this story. You know, and, and we take this maybe as, as a model for how we should pray. Or, um, but we have to be slightly careful. Uh, when we're dealing with, with Old Testament narrative, the Old Testament story, but we need to remember that, that Ezra is you know, a unique, he has a unique and particular role to play here as the leader of God's people. You know, he's not necessarily a model for us uh, to follow because you know, he's speaking to God as the representative, right, on behalf of the nation, as their advocate. You know, it, it's all down... Uh, to him, and that's not our job. You, uh, our role is not to um, confess the sins of everyone else to God. I mean, imagine that. I mean, imagine how judgmental we'd get if we did that. Okay, that's not our role. Now, look, a side point as we read this, Ezra's prayer should make us question how we feel about sin. Yeah, it's not the main point, but I, I wonder if we're ever moved like this when we're confronted with our own unfaithfulness. And when we see God ignored and forsaken in the world he's made. You know, I wonder if we've become a bit desensitized, a bit blasé about just how serious sin is. Does it make us tear our clothes, pull out our hair if we've still got it? Do we sit all day in silence, ashamed and disgraced? I mean, it's not the main point, but we should stop and pause and consider, shouldn't we, how we react to sin? Uh, but our role is not to be like Ezra. No, because as we come towards the end of the book of Ezra, uh, this Ezra and Nehemiah story, we, we should be left feeling slightly down. You see, Ezra's a good guy. He did all that he could to make things right. But ultimately, he falls short. Because he's not able to deal with the people's unfaithfulness, the people's sin. You know, he can't provide a lasting solution. He can just throw himself at the feet of God and say, over to you, we need your mercy. Uh, so when we encounter characters uh, like this in the Old Testament, we, we, 
we can't just put ourselves in and, and kind of lead us more and say, be like Ezra. But we should see them, and we can see Ezra as a, as a forerunner, a, a pointer, a type, a shadow that shows us what we really need. You see, Ezra here is acting as an advocate for Israel. But he can't provide any lasting change. And so his prayer finishes by leaving everything in God's hands with no sure or certain hope. Your God has been so gracious to Israel, and he will be again, but Ezra knows that the unfaithfulness cannot be left unpunished because God is also perfectly just. God can't just sweep it all under the carpet like it never happens. It has to be dealt with. And so Ezra can't offer any lasting hope. Now Ezra shows us that we don't just need an advocate. No, we need an advocate who can also deal with the sin problem for good. That's what we should be looking for. That's what, that's what Ezra points us to in this chapter. And we find that advocate who can deal with sin 400 years later in Jesus. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, do flick across to that if you've got a Bible in front of you. It will come up on the screen. But the first two verses of 1 John chapter 2, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do you see? Do you see how Jesus is both our advocate and atoning sacrifice? He is both, and not just for Israel, but for the whole world. See, Israel's only hope was in God's grace, but they couldn't see in the Old Testament how everything would work out with any certainty. Now we, we live this side of the cross. We live the other side of Jesus. We we are New Testament, New Covenant people, and so we have the privilege of seeing how God's grace has its fullest expression. We see how God's justice is perfectly met and his grace wonderfully given at the same time all through the person and work of his son. And so our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Firstly, initially for salvation. He is our atoning sacrifice. That's kind of strange language, isn't it? But, but it means that he has taken the punishment for our sins. You know, the sins of the world. You know, what Ezra was unable to do. Jesus, the righteous one, accomplished. You know, we already said that, that God just can't ignore sin and unfaithfulness because he's holy and just. It it has to be dealt with. There has to be a debt paid. But at the cross, God's justice was satisfied by his own son. Jesus took all the sin of the world on him as he died. Which means that God's grace is now freely available to anyone who wants it. It is sure and it is certain. If you you put your hope in Jesus Christ, that is, if you confess your unfaithfulness to God, if you acknowledge your own sin, if if you hold up your hands and say, my bad, and you throw himself at his mercy, then God's grace is yours in Jesus because of his sacrifice. Your debt is is paid. The punishment has been taken by him. And look, many of us here this morning and watching, I'm sure, we, we know this to be true and it's so good to be reminded, isn't it? Of what God has done for us in Jesus. That, that should never stop being incredible, should it? 
But maybe this is news to you. Maybe you're hearing this for the first time or in the last few weeks. But look, we'd love to, to chat, to answer questions. If you're here this morning, do grab one of us in the car park afterwards in a small group. You, or, or get in touch. We, we, don't let your questions go unanswered. Because this is extraordinary. This is sure and certain hope in the face of your own guilt. But there is one big question left unanswered, I think, this morning that we should address. Here's the burning question. What if we mess things up again? Yeah, sure, Jesus is our only hope in salvation, but what if we mess it up again, just like Israel? What about when we sin now? Well, nothing changes. It is Jesus Christ that saves us. And it is Jesus Christ who enables us to continue walking in fellowship with the Father. It is Jesus that saves us. It's Jesus that helps us to keep going. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ for our salvation and day after day after day until glory. Do you see? Because he is our advocate. Right now, sat with God, Yet here is the hope from John. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate, the righteous one, Jesus Christ. His death paid for the sins of the past, the present, and the future. It's done. You, all rebellion and unfaithfulness has been dealt with. All of it. I mean, it's hard to get our heads around, isn't it? But the stuff that you are going to do wrong in the future is already paid for. It's already dealt with. This is such good news. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have nothing to fear. Whatever this week brings. Look, you will mess up. You will fall short. That is part of the Christian life now. But, but look, you don't need to listen to the lies that Satan tells you. You know the ones that I mean? Those ones where you just feel like you can't approach God anymore because of what you've done, because of the way that you've let him down. Those lies that Satan drips into your head say, you're not really good enough. Look at, how, look at what you thought about that person. Look about what you said in that conversation. God doesn't really want to know you. Look, you, you can ignore those lies because your guilt and shame is dealt with. Satan has nothing on you. He can accuse you all he wants. But we have an advocate who sits at God's right hand, who simply says, paid that debt, covered it. Satan, you've got nothing. They're one of mine. There's no accusation, no condemnation. Because Jesus is our advocate right now. He's our only hope day after day after day until glory. Now look, this isn't a carte blanche to live as you please. And I guess you felt that that was coming. No, we are just as susceptible as Israel were to being led astray, aren't we? To wandering off into unfaithfulness. And, and it may not be through marriage, but we all have areas of our lives where you know, other influences can begin to take root. You know, it could be you know, at work, whether you're the only Christian in the office or, you know, in the running club or the mums at the school gate. You know, the box set you're binge watching, what, or the media outlet that you get your news from, or whatever it is. Look, we need to be aware, don't we, that there are other voices in our lives that can lead us astray and lead us into unfaithfulness. Lead us away from living as God intends, and we need to be aware of that. Now, we can't just live as we please. We'll need to regularly repent of our shortcomings. But unlike Ezra, unlike Ezra, we can do it with a sure and certain hope. 
Because ultimately, Jesus has rewritten verse 15 for us. Do you see? You for us, this side of the cross, with Jesus as our advocate, verse 15 says, here we are before you. Because of Jesus, we can stand in your presence. Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that crazy? Because of Jesus, because he's finally dealt with everything. All the sin, past, present, future, we can stand in God's glorious presence, not guilty. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ.